There must be something wrong with this padding. It's slowing me down. But you know what's really crazy about this situation? Here I am, all padded for protection and insulation against the cold. And outside, it's a hot sunny day. Ooh. Well, it takes a lot of energy to keep the inside cold while the outside is hot. But over the years, we have learned how to do it. I suppose it's all part of what started out to be merely a need to survive. It is now a desire to be comfortable. So we continue to tackle the elements, and when you think about it, it's amazing how far we have come. But it isn't always that easy, nor is it necessarily wise to try to oppose the laws of nature. One way or another, design has to deal with them. We can't design as if nature didn't exist. If we did, sooner or later the consequences would catch up with us. So that is what this programme is all about. Looking at some of the ways in which design has to consider the elements of what a long time ago were known as the earth, air, fire and water, and what we now call the forces of nature. And that means looking at the effects of heat, cold and insulation. Not just thermal insulation, but electrical and acoustic. Then we'll look at the influences of air, wind and water, and that will lead us to other issues like pressure and friction. And to do that, we'll need to remind ourselves of some basic laws of physics, using everyday situations that we can find in a local community, such as this one. You see, it isn't too difficult to look at any product and to work out from the clues it offers which of the laws of nature will have to be respected for the product to function well or not. But first, I think I'll put on something a little more appropriate. To begin with, we have to be aware of a fundamental law of nature, which states that any object will want to move from a higher level to a lower level. That's true for a car rolling down a hill, and it's also true for heat. It will want to flow from a high level to a low one, or to put it another way, from a hotter source to a colder one. That's why, if left alone, a hot cup of coffee will cool to the temperature of the room. To understand the significance of this, let's look at something that helps to insulate us inside our building from whatever the weather is outside, the windows. Now, most of us realise that double glazing insulates us from the heat and the cold by trapping a layer of air between two panes of glass. There is actually an optimum distance between the panes of about 10 to 12 millimetres required to stop the heat flowing in or out through the window. And it can do that in three ways. Radiation, conduction and convection. Let's use a cross-section through this window to illustrate. First, the sun can warm the inside of a room simply by the radiation of its heat through any medium. That's why it can be warm just standing next to the window. If we want to reduce the radiation, we can coat the windows to cut down this effect. Now, this is quite commonly seen on office buildings which use tinted glass or even mirrored glazing to reflect away the radiation. We could, of course, use a blind. Heat can also be transferred by conduction, which simply means that a material can transfer heat through itself. And glass is a pretty good conductor of heat. So in a thermal window, we have two panes of glass that don't touch each other. And that's the main purpose of the space between them. And the third method of heat transfer is by convection. That is, heat transferred by a medium that flows, like a liquid, or in this case, air. That is what a warm wind is, moving air that's carrying heat. That's why we have only a 10 to 12 millimetre gap, because if it were any wider, there would be so much air trapped, the convection currents could easily be set up, which would make the window ineffective as an insulator. If the gap were too narrow, then heat could be transferred by conduction. But windows aren't the only things where air is an important insulator. You'd be amazed how many there are. To protect ourselves in climates that are harsh and severe, we originally used furs, skins and feathers for thermal insulation. In other words, air. Fur traps air around the animal, insulating it from the cold. Natural oils stop the hairs from freezing and the fluffiness of the coat can be adjusted by the animal to trap lots of air, or just a little, to allow ventilation to the skin, or not. They use their coats as a kind of thermostat. Feathers work just the same way for a bird. And 
unfortunately for the birds and the furry animals, but fortunately for us, we got fur and down coats and more recently feather and down comforters and ski jackets. They are often referred to as lightweight. Why? Because they contain lots of air, trapped in pockets between the feathers and nowadays between their artificial substitutes like tinsulate. The only problem occurs when we get materials like down wet. The water has replaced the air, so no insulation. There used to be a problem with ski jackets when it rained, or even when we would get hot and perspire. Now we have new outer fabrics like Gore-Tex, which are porous enough to allow perspiration to pass as steam through from inside to out, but are not porous enough for water droplets to get in and to dampen the insulation. The same principle is applied to house insulation. Glass fibre wadding between the studs traps the air and a vapour barrier prevents moisture entering the insulation from inside the house. Any holes in the barrier and we end up with wet fibre and no insulation, and not to mention structural damage from the dampness. There is, however, something even better than air, and that's a vacuum. Heat cannot pass except by radiation across a vacuum. That's where the thermos flask comes in handy. The liquid in this flask was kept cool inside two glass containers separated by a vacuum. Naturally, it can keep hot things hot just as easily. So far then, we have been dealing with thermal insulation and its influences on design, but there are other types. In a way, a thermos flask is a bit like a car battery because one stores heat energy, the other stores electrical energy. The car battery doesn't need a vacuum, but it does need insulation. This plastic case is a good insulator, which means it's also a bad conductor. The metal wires are good conductors, and the plastic around them a good insulator. Obviously, when we leave our lights on, the energy drains away by conduction through the copper wires, and we get a dead battery. What stops the electricity from leaking away, apart from the switches to turn off the power to your lights, is the air itself. Yes, air is a poor conductor of electrical energy too. That's why birds aren't electrocuted when they sit on power lines. They don't complete a circuit with the ground. They aren't earthed, so power will not be conducted through them. In the same way, air is used as an insulator in electrical power tools as well. This plastic case is a poor conductor of electricity and the air inside also helps us keep insulated from the electrical components inside. Of course, there's some need for ventilation and slots are provided, never more than six millimetres wide, just narrow enough to prevent the prodding of little fingers. The design of any object must be appropriate, in this case, appropriate to the needs of insulation, whether it's from the cold, heat or electric shock. But sometimes we need insulation for another reason, because there's too much noise. That's better. The trouble with sound is that it can be so noisy. You see, sound travels in waves through a medium, which could be brick or water, but it can't be a vacuum. No, sound can't travel through nothing. It usually travels through our old friend, the air, because sound too is a form of energy trying to move from a higher level to a lower one. And given time, it will disperse or dissipate itself into silence. But when it's too loud, we can't always wait for that to happen. So what can we do? Well, two things. We can surround it with some dense material, like this concrete block wall, that sound will have trouble getting through. In general, the higher frequencies tend to be easier to absorb than lower frequencies. That's why we hear the bass more easily when the neighbours are having a party. Alternatively, we obstruct or baffle it. Acoustic panels are full of holes and air. Sound passes through the holes and bounces around inside and behind until it's exhausted. That's how a muffler works. And sometimes it doesn't. So, what's next? Well, let's leave noisy cars and look at quiet ones. With modern material technology, we can now produce vehicles with smooth aerodynamic shapes. The purpose is to create a form that bumps into as little air as possible. The car glides or slices through the air smoothly, allowing the air to gently reform behind, producing the minimum turbulence. And as a result, a much quieter ride for the people inside the car. There are added bonuses too. 
the car uses less energy because there is less air resistance. And the foam makes the car easier to keep clean, since there are less places for water to collect. Three benefits for the price of one. It's not just style, but good design. However, marketing demands often modify the forms for more superficial reasons. How could a sports car still be aerodynamic when its headlights are sticking up in the air? It suggests that aerodynamic theory only works during the daylight hours, which is silly, of course. And the pop-up lights can allow water to collect and corrode the steel, yet another natural process. However, smooth, rounded forms are useful in other situations when combating the forces of nature. The same smooth forms we found on those cars can be seen on the bottom of these boats. And the reasons are similar. A smooth hull cuts through the water more easily and uses less energy. Boat designers have known this for years. But there is more. By using a smooth, round form, the weight of the boat is distributed evenly all over the hull. That's why the skin of the hull of most boats could be relatively thin and, in turn, relatively light. And because the pressure at any point is small. The same principle is used for the igloo. This too is, in a way, aerodynamic. It allows cold winds to pass smoothly over and around it with minimal loading on its outside surface. You see, when dealing with the forces of air and water, round is usually beautiful. Let me show you something else. Roundness plays an important role when dealing with liquids on the inside of objects, such as this glass. The roundness helps to distribute the weight of the liquid evenly and it also makes cleaning easier and it works with the laws of gravity. This brandy bowl, for example, has a narrow mouth because we want to cut down on the evaporation and retain the aroma. This is expensive stuff. And the stem is quite short because we want the hand to cup the bowl to warm the liquid slightly. Here's a glass which keeps our hands away from the bowl. We hold the wine glass by the stem so that the white wine remains chilled. Uh, this wine glass has an open mouth to allow the wine to breathe, perfect for red wines. Of course, there are variations, but all wines, spirits and liquors are best drunk at certain temperatures and with controlled exposure to the air. So the forms of these glasses are functional and often beautiful. But there is also an aspect which the design of these glasses doesn't immediately show, and that is related to how the wine is delivered to the palate. The mouth and the tongue are sensitive in different ways in different places. Sweetness at the tip of the tongue, saltiness and acidity further back and towards the sides of the mouth, and bitterness and sourness further back still. So if we sip from a glass of this shape, we wouldn't have to tip it back very far, and the wine would reach the sweetness taste buds at the tip of the tongue first. Ideal if you want to mask the acidity of a young wine, for instance. You'd have to tip your head back further to drink from this glass, and so the wine would reach the back of the mouth first. And this tulip-shaped glass sends the wine to the sides of the mouth. It's all a matter of choice, of course, but the fact is the glass shape does make a difference. And that's good news, because it's the shape of the glass that's important, not the cost. And that's equally important for expensive wines and cheap ones. For me, it's a little too early in the afternoon to drink wine, so I prefer a nice cup of tea. A basic teapot is shaped like a sphere, no matter what the style, and for a very functional reason. A sphere represents the maximum volume that can be wrapped with a minimum of material. In other words, it requires the least surface area to enclose it, which would minimise the surface from which heat could be lost through radiation and conduction. So that helps keep the tea in a teapot hot longer. It only needs enough of a flat bottom to stand up. The handle is on the side to reduce contact with the heat and to keep the lid area open for pouring in the hot water. The lid has a long skirt which makes its centre of gravity lower. This prevents the lid from falling out when we pour the tea. But here's something that has plagued all of us. Drips. To avoid dripping, the spout height must be above the height of the tea to stop it pouring out prematurely. But what about the drips running down the outside of the spout, termed the teapot effect? Well, let me explain. In the true design tradition, let's test some of these. Now, this milk carton seems to pour quite well. 
it has a narrow opening whilst this water jug has a wide lip and seems to pour quite well too. So it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the width of the lip or spout. Let's try this maple syrup jug. Oops, yeah, not so good. Let's try the teapot. Not bad, but it starts to drip when I'm about to stop pouring. Let's check out the coffee pot. Pretty good. In fact, a little better than the teapot. So what's the secret or secrets? Well, the key to successful pouring is to divide things up into three parts. First, the flow before the lip. Next, what happens at the lip. And finally, what happens after the lip. When we poured from the milk carton, we saw a lot of fluid passing over a sharp lip. The flow before the lip was well established. By that we mean not turbulent. And the lip didn't slow or obstruct the flow at all. The water jug showed just the same thing. The water coming out of it was like a thin layer. Of course, this changes when we start to pour slowly, and that's when we get problems. That is what is happening with the maple syrup. It's more viscous or thicker, so it moves even more slowly, and it's difficult to establish a well-aligned flow. So it seems that the speed with which the liquid leaves the spout or lip and the quality of the flow are important. Now, Let's get to the lip. If the flow is well established when it hits the lip, it will, as we can see with the milk and the coffee pot, carry on, almost like a projectile. It is what is termed ballistic flow, like a bullet. However, when the flow slows down, the liquid starts to be sucked back towards the spout. Now, why is that? Well, the force that does it is the atmospheric pressure acting on the outside of the liquid, just at the edge of the spout, the fluid on the underside is under very low or negative pressure because it flows quicker than the fluid on top. So there's a pressure drop across the liquid which forces it to stick to the underside of the spout. The slower the flow or the more viscous the liquid, the easier it is for this tiny force to have effect. But in general, for successful pouring, we need the liquid to leave as ballistically as it can. To achieve this, the lip should be as clean and sharp as possible. That's where many ceramic pots have problems. Because if they were to have a sharp edge, they would be brittle and would therefore chip when used. Having no glaze on the outside of the spout, but with glaze only on the inside, will provide enough of a sharp edge. But it has to stop at exactly the right spot. Plastic additions could be used instead, or the spout could turn slightly upward at the end, or a hole and a groove can be added right here to allow the liquid to run down the outside and back in through this hole. Very clever. So a teapot is shaped like a teapot mostly for functional reasons, to appropriately deal with hot liquids, atmospheric pressure, gravity, and how it will be used. Wouldn't it be nice if whenever we went to buy something that was meant to pour a liquid, we could test it? There might be a whole lot less stains on our tablecloths. Let's look at another kind of liquid and see how this time we can take advantage of the laws of physics. It's always exciting to find examples where the laws of nature are used to good effect. We have to spend so much of our time dealing with the difficulties nature sends us that it's nice to take advantage once in a while. Now, why doesn't the ink in this pen fall out of the end? Well, the ink is so sticky and viscous that it can't fall out. It sticks to itself, so there's no need to worry about air getting in to fill up the barrel above the ink. Yet the pen writes smoothly. So how does the ink come out? How does it work? Well, the answer is by taking advantage of the effects of two things, pressure and friction. As we found with the design of boat hulls, if we distribute a force over a large area, then the pressure or force on one part of that area is small. The opposite is also true. Even a very small force concentrated on a small point can generate enormous pressure. That's how a needle can be easily pushed through, say, a, a strip of leather. Naturally, then, the force at the tip of this pen can be quite large. So large that when the ball rolls out the ink, the ink is squashed between the paper and the ball. The ink is pressure sensitive, which means it becomes thinner, more liquid when pressed. So it flows off the ball and the pen glides over the paper. But what makes the ball turn? Friction. 
friction is caused by the surface of one material rubbing against another. When two materials virtually stick together, the friction is very large, and when they start to slide, it becomes very small. The friction between the ball and the paper forces the ball to roll, which then allows more ink to come out and rub off and leave its mark. If there were no friction, the pen would just slide about and leave nothing and the ink almost instantly dries in contact with the air. And it was this that led to the invention and manufacture of pens that don't leak, can write uphill, and also allow left-handed people to write with little chance of smudging their work. Amazing, isn't it? Shh. Uh, that's enough for pens, but I want to explore the effects of friction a little further. Without friction, a ladder placed against the side of a building would just slide down. But it doesn't, because of the friction between the ladder and the wall, as well as between the ladder and the ground. The friction is a reaction to the load placed on the wall and the ground by the weight of the ladder, as well as the person on it. Friction is, in fact, one of the most influential of all the natural forces on the design of products. Take opening a jar, for example. We want the grip, or the friction between our hands and the lid, to be greater than the friction between the jar and the inside edge of the lid. When it is, we open the jar. When it isn't, well, we can put it under the hot water tap, hoping the lid will expand on the jar and will succeed the second time. But for us, grip or friction is concerned with the roughness between our skin and the lid. What is ideal for maximum friction or grip occurs when the texture of one material surface matches the texture of the other. This can be seen in the design of tyres. With more tyre surface in contact with the ground, the better the grip. For proof, we only have to look at the tyres on a Grand Prix car. They're called slicks because they are completely smooth all over. A lot of surface area of the same texture as the road surface, which then keeps the car on the track. The tyres on everyday cars are a combination of both tread form and contact surface area, so they work on dry roads and in the snow. But a problem for all tyres occurs when it rains. We tend to lose friction and slide, because the water acts like a lubricant, like the sweat on our hands or the oil in a car engine. So we have to get rid of the water between the tyre and the road. And we do that by putting grooves in the surface of the tyre for the water to be sucked up and thrown out to the side so that the tyre tread can grip the road surface below, restoring the friction. So if it wasn't for friction, there'd be an awful lot of car accidents. We couldn't climb ladders, write with ballpoint pens or pencils, nor could we open or seal jars. So whenever a designer wants something to move or something has to slide against something else, friction has to be dealt with appropriately. Design has to contend with all the laws and forces of nature and often in combination with each other. For instance, when we combine friction with pressure, we produce heat and that's how we can skate on ice. You see, when we skate, we concentrate our weight onto the skate blade, which puts pressure on the ice. It warms, then melts, and so we really skate on a bead of water. You can see this on a cross-section diagram of this skate blade. A concave blade gives us two cutting edges and a groove to carry the bead of water that pressure creates from the ice. Clever, eh? Appropriate design, once again. So, in this programme, we've seen that a common-sense study of basic science and the laws of nature provide us with important clues to function and use, which must be respected and used to advantage where possible when judging the success of a design or when creating a design in the first place. Many of our most embarrassing moments, either as designers or consumers, seem to happen when simple scientific principles haven't worked in our favour either because they weren't considered or because we forgot to respect them. Things that got too hot or too cold, lost or gained energy, did or did not conduct electricity, that were too noisy or too slippery or got stuck when we didn't want them to. Nature offers some pretty powerful forces, so it makes sense to take advantage of them where possible. And it's great when we get it right. That's what good design is all about. 
In the next program, we'll be looking at culture and internationalism and their effect on design, particularly in Canada. Well, I think I'll give it another go.